Good morning, Thomas Mayer. How are you doing today? I'm good. Pierre, good morning to you too. Thomas, uh, thank you very much for uh, your time. Uh, I think people are going to be impressed by what you have achieved, who you are, and all the good information you're going to share to all the listeners of Check In, which is every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And today I am with Thomas who is an associate professor at the University of San Francisco for the hospitality management program. So Thomas, I uh, looked at your LinkedIn profile and we talked, obviously I know you for quite a few years. And when you sent me your resume, I was like, I don't know this man as much as so that I know you. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, I'm like, you know, usually we take an hour uh, during that discussion, but I feel like reading all that you've done, I mean, these can last two or three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was impressed by all that you're doing and, and, and our listeners are gonna see what I mean. I'm gonna try to sum up all that, you, who you are, you know, for people who don't know you, if you don't mind, it will take me maybe two or three minutes. Is that okay sure. with you? That's great, Pierre. And then we can go into a discussion and I'm going to ask you questions about your career. So, great. first of all, about your education. Well, you, you know, you, you started with an AA at the Morrisville College in restaurant management. So very early on, you were involved in the restaurant management business or education. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you got a BS at the Rochester Institute of Technology in hotel and tourist enterprises. Following this, you, got, you went to the Salve Regina University for human development. Following this, you went to Gonzaga University for leadership philosophy. And more recently, uh, you went to Harvard University. Uh, about design thinking and educational design. So that's about your education. So you really, really have a restaurant, hotel, leadership, design involved. So you, you really have a very, I would say, widespread panels of knowledge and education. Yep. So we'll talk about this, but that's only about education. You did 20 uh, scholarship publications that were published in different journals. We're not gonna talk about all of them, but we're gonna talk about a few of them. Good. And then you did three books, uh, and we'll talk about those books as well. Uh, as far as experiences, you started your career uh, in the hotel industry, but on the food and beverage side, you were a director of food and beverage at Starwood Hotels and Resorts, now Marriott. Uh, you were in Hawaii, you were at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, the Sheraton Kauai, Kauai Resort, and Hotel Hana Maui. Uh, following this, you worked for Red Lions Hotels Corporation, where you were Vice President of Operation Northwestern and California Region Market, uh, covering annual revenues of approximately 220 million. And following this, you were working for GVD Hospitality Corporation as a president, uh, hotel management and development company. Uh, so asset management services for uh, VCs, new property acquisition modeling, and boutique hotel property management, food and beverage concept, and repositioning. So finally, you did a lot of research and a lot of industry learning based collaboration. Uh, you worked with fantastic restaurant, one being the number one hotel uh, restaurant in the world, Silver Play, with, uh, well, uh, Guy Savoy uh, restaurant, the chef Guy Savoy restaurant in uh, Paris. You worked for leading hotel of the world, uh, Fairmont Sonoma Mission Inn and Spa in Sonoma, Water Bar in San Francisco, which is a fantastic restaurant, and SoftBank Robotics. Wow, 
this is very interesting. So my first question to you <laughs> is why, why did you get involved into the restaurant, food, and hotel business? How did that come along? Where did you have this passion from, and why did you choose this way? What a, what a great question, Pierre, and uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to check in with you. What a great idea you have here. Uh, you're a terrific marketer, and we love working with you. We'll get to that, but it's just a pleasure to be uh, participating with you with your great ideas. Um, so I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. It's not the best metropolis uh, place in the world. And uh, I was fascinated with race cars when I was a young man at 16 years old. And I originally was going to go to school and learn how to be a mechanic. But my father yelled at me and he said, are you sure you want to be underneath a greasy car working on cars the rest of your life? You better think twice about that. So at 16 years old, you don't have much uh, depth of thinking. And I thought, well, I already signed up for college. What's another major I could take at Morrisville State College? They had a restaurant management program. And my part-time jobs as a young man, uh, I worked as a dishwasher and I worked as a busboy in an Italian restaurant called Salvatore's Italian Gardens. And I used to see the owner come in. He was a very uh, well-groomed, he looked like a movie star with his gray white hair slicked back and a beautiful pressed suit. And he drive the Lincoln Continental fancy car and walk through the restaurant and said hi to everybody and had wonderful food. And I thought, I'm gonna own my own restaurant one day. So uh, I started with my career in restaurant management and then uh, worked for two years in the, uh, in the restaurant program academically and then transferred to RIT for hotel and tourism management so I could complete my undergraduate work in restaurants and hotels and resorts. Wow. So, so you, I mean, that was, should we say luck, but as well, you already had experiences of restaurants. So you had that first touch of being in the restaurant business. Yeah. I loved the restaurant business when I was a young boy and my favorite part of being a dishwasher, it's not the most glamorous job. Uh, the waiters always come in and dump their dirty dishes and all the scrap foods come at you. You have to clean these big pots and pans. But the favorite part of my day was at the end of the shift when the chef would call me over and serve me a nice cut of fresh prime rib for dinner. So I learned early on, being in the kitchen, you get to eat really good food. <laughs> That's a very valuable lesson. <laughs> yeah. Always eat good food if you can. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the best benefits of the restaurant business. Long hours, but great food. So how did you tie in with the hotel? So we, you, you started your career with Starwood Hotels Resorts. How did this opportunity came around? And I mean, you wanted to work for restaurants, but why did you choose, choose the, hotels, the hotel path? Yeah, good question, Pierre. Um, I really had a choice because I had a job offer to be at a front desk manager at a property in Florida or I had a chance to be an assistant food and beverage director at an airport property with Starwood or Sheraton Hotels at the time. Um, so I thought I could go independent restaurant career if I joined a restaurant group, or I could go to a hotel and do food and beverage within a hotel. And I thought I would have more flexibility with my career than if I worked for two to five years in food and beverage in a hotel. If I didn't like it, I could always transfer to the rooms division and get into sales or rooms management, and I would still be in the hotel environment. So I thought it offered the best flexibility. And I even think today, as I coach our, our hospitality students, if you like food and beverage, you might as well just go into a really good hotel chain that does food and beverage uh, very well and learn the food and beverage industry there. You can always leave and go work for an independent restaurant anytime you want. Great. So I got lucky, I got lucky, I started in a hotel I went in at a really high level after graduation. I got very lucky. I didn't have to be a dining room manager or an assistant dining room manager. I went right in as an assistant F&B. So I was exposed to the whole food department right out of college. Wow, yeah, that's, and, and, on, yeah, and on top of it, you worked for a large group. Yes. So working for Starwood was, from the get-go, opening new doors to many brands and yeah. many countries. If you wanted to travel, you could have gone anywhere in the world. Well, that's very good. And so what did you learn most when you were at Starwoods for, well, for quite a few years you were there, for 16 years? Yes. Wow. What was, 
what was the brand about? What did you like so much about Starwood to work there for so long? And what did you learn from that experience yeah. as a food and beverage director and really being at the hotel? What did you get from it? Yeah, um, I think, Pierre, you mentioned it a few moments ago. What was intriguing about Sheraton Hotels and Starwood is they were a global brand. So they had the, uh, they had the Middle East, they had Asia, they had Europe, they had North America. So I figured I would start my career in an exotic place. So I, I quickly left Buffalo after two years of experience as an assistant food and beverage director. I moved to Hawaii in the Hawaiian Islands and they had the most beautiful resorts in the world. Uh, open air hallways, they had multiple units in a, in a hotel. The first uh, uh, management position I had there, we had 15 food and beverage outlets. So there was a great variety of food and beverage operations from fine dining to nightclub, to room service, to beachside cafe, to wine bars, to patisseries. They had everything you could imagine. They were very much influenced by European gastronomy at the time. So I worked with many European chefs, a German chef, French chef, uh, and, uh, Asian chefs from both China and Japan. So Hawaii was a melting pot for diversity, but it was also a very high level quality gastronomy experience. So as a young food and beverage director, I had great variety to learn from. Now, the, the hardest part of the job was two things. One, you had to learn attention to detail very early on. You had to learn to have um, very good refinement in service and cleanliness and service etiquette. The second most important uh, part for being a food and beverage director, not being a cooker, even though I took foundational culinary classes to understand nutrition, portion size, recipe control, food and beverage cost management, I understand uh, learning about food and cuisine is very, very uh, cumbersome and takes a lot of focus. So I had to learn a steep learning curve. To, and at the time, it was Asian rim cuisine. So I had to learn uh, recipes and food costing and plate presentation. So I would say the diversity of learning environment, the attention to detail and service etiquette, along with the food, were really challenging. And I, I had to work a six-day work week. 12 hours a day just to keep up with the job. Very intense. Yeah, a lot of time, uh, some of my friends that are not in our industry, they think that when you go to those destinations, you know, like Hawaii being one of them, uh, well, it's all about, it's an easy job. Well, it's probably where you work the most, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you have just one day off and working very long hours, right? It's a, yes, very long hours. It's a misconception we have. <laughs> yeah, but it's fun. So the fact that I was in an, uh, living in an island and looking out at a beautiful ocean and the prettiest sunsets and working with international guests from all over the world, meeting very fascinating people, just VIP service alone at the, the, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel was a luxury resort. We had famous people from all over the world staying there. I used to spend 40 minutes very first thing in the morning reviewing a list of all the VIPs and to make sure that the caviar and the sushi and the Dom Pignon champagne and chocolate dipped strawberries, petit fours, everything was properly arranged and delivered to these guest rooms. So uh, it's very fun. It goes fast. Uh, it's very long hours, but it was every minute of the day I learned. And I can honestly tell you in my 20s, early in my career, having that kind of challenge uh, for the 10 years I was out in Hawaii, I never had a harder job in my life till this day. So it really set the tone for my career early on and everything else from there was easier. Hard to say, but it was. So let me ask you a question. Just be behind you on your left side, it seems that you have a painting and yes. it looks like you have a painting from Hawaii. <laughs> yes, it's a painting of the island of Kauai and it's called the Kalalau Valley. It's a view, beautiful, beautiful canyon area that uh, you hike to, and it's one of my favorite spots in the world. See, I love your background. You have Kauai, and then on, the, on your right side, you have bottles of wines. So, yes. And then a map of the world. So yes. we, we know about you just by looking at your background. That's right. And my second favorite place in the world is over my right shoulder, my other shoulder, which is uh, Bordeaux and saint Emilion. And uh, okay. I, was able, I was able to meet a family we're going to talk about later, but Saint Emilion, the village, is probably the, my most favorite place in the world. 
Well, we'll talk about that because you have some very interesting stories. So 16 years at Starwood, and then you moved on to Red Lion Hotels uh, in 1992. Could you tell us about that transition and your move from uh, Hawaii to the mainland, as they refer to it, and what opportunity you got, and what did you learn from Red Lion, where you stayed, where for quite a few years as well. You stayed there uh, 15 years? Yep, 15. Yeah, so... Starwood was probably 10, and Red Lion was 15. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's, well, that's those, okay. Are long ex those are long experiences, you know, because yep. in our industry, a lot of time, people will switch after three or four years, mm -hmm. and you always stayed for quite a long time. So tell us about Red Lion and your experience there, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, Pierre, I often tell my students uh, a very good career growth strategy is being a small fish in a big pond or being a big fish in a small pond. And here's what I mean. When I went to Hawaii and worked for Starwood, I was in a very big pond and I was a tiny little fish, meaning the learning curve for me was astronomical. I had to really work hard to keep my job and then to do well in my job. But those 10 years in Hawaii, being a small fish in a big pond, afforded me the opportunity then to learn from the best, the best standards, uh, the best attention to detail, very solid financial management skills, uh, owner relationships, all the kind of uh, intense requirements of management. Working in a union environment, managing a, a bargaining unit was very difficult as well. So then after I built up that, what I'm gonna call, um, intellectual capital and knowledge from working with the best, I thought at some point in my career, I could then move down market and go to a smaller pond and be a big fish. So my goal after working 10 years in Hawaii at the operational level was to eventually move to the C-suite. And I thought that I could earn better money, I could um, have a wider uh, portfolio of hotels and I could have better work hours and have less operational uh, requirements on weekends, etc. So a better work-life balance. So the opportunity presented itself uh, in Hawaii. I met my wife of 32 years now, Sherry. She's from the island of Kauai. She was a hula dancer, a hula instructor, entrepreneur, but she also was in the uh, ho uh, hotelier. She was in human resources and management. So that was really good as a companion and as a partner to be with somebody that understands the business like I do, they're, they're, they understand the work demands and the hours. So that was a blessing to me. So living in Hawaii her whole life, she had a desire to leave Hawaii. Most of us that aren't from Hawaii have a desire to go to Hawaii. So uh, <laughs> we're at the point where I was ready to make a break. So we bought some farmland in Montana and I wanted to grow specialty crop vegetables. So I was a small gentleman farmer and I grew baby carrots and baby zucchinis and baby squashes. The only problem was in Montana, they eat meat and potatoes in large portions. So nobody wants baby vegetables that look really cute. So uh, <laughs> I, I, that was turned into a hobby and not a career. So uh, I ended up uh, joining Red Lion Corporation as a general manager of a small hotel in a mall. So I actually ran a hotel and a retail shopping mall for five years in Montana. And then the company liked my performance. So they kept bugging me to move Eastern Washington where they had their corporate headquarters. So they finally offered me a job in the C-suite as an operations vice president. So I took it, moved the family and then had a great career in the C-suite for about uh, eight years with them. Wow, fantastic. Yeah. Well, you, I didn't see that in your resume. <laughs> well, I, I did, that was just a hobby. <laughs> and uh, so in 2007, you, uh, you were the president, uh, hotel management and development for J JVD Hospitality Corporation. And you uh, worked there for two years. Could you tell us? Uh, sure. What you did? That was actually my transition from a hospitality industry to the hospitality education. So after I worked at my, as a corporate vice president, it was very demanding, uh, but very fulfilling. Uh, I figured that what am I gonna do the next 20 years of my life? So I started planning ahead. I was fortunate enough that where our corporate headquarters was in Spokane, Washington, was right next door to Gonzaga University. And they had a PhD program in leadership philosophy. 
So I actually worked full time as a corporate vice president, Monday through Friday. I'll remember when all of my colleagues were leaving work on Friday, going home for the weekend, I had to stay in the office and work on my computer writing papers. I went to school on Friday nights and Saturday mornings for four years to work on my PhD so that I could transition. As Soon as I got my PhD, I, I started looking for jobs in the uh, ec ec environment. And I wasn't quite sure I wanted to fully leave industry. So I had met an owner that I'd worked for before as a um, corporate vice president that bought properties for Red Lion. And he asked me if I wanted to form a hotel company with him and I said, yes. So I started the hotel group with him and was doing teaching online at night with my PhD. And I was gonna hang on for a while to see if I could do both. And you can't be the president of a company and do anything else but be the president of a company. So I learned after about two years that I would stop. Uh, we amicably broke up as a uh, partnership. Uh, he's gone on now to build a uh, $15 million corporation. He keeps reminding me what I walked away from. But, um, <laughs> but for those last 10 years that I've been teaching now, I wouldn't trade in all the experiences that I had and the work-life balance that I've been able to achieve now as a professor. So that was the last of my, my full-time industry work. And it was a transition to get out of the industry into uh, academia. Well, very well. So, so that's when you joined the University of San Francisco. We have the logo right here. Yes. And you, did you went uh, and worked right away for the hospitality management program? Yes. I actually uh, spent four years at DePaul University in Chicago. Uh, as an assistant professor, they started a new hospitality leadership program there. And I was going up for tenure, which in our world just means that you're finally promoted to the next level professor and a lifetime of employment. And um, they give you a window to decide if you're gonna stay or leave. And I took the opportunity when the job opened up at University of San Francisco, because I love the Bay Area for three things. I love the Bay Area for their food and gastronomy. I love the Bay Area for their environment and nature. And I love their environment for Napa Valley and the wine region. So when that job opened, I took the chance to move to San Francisco and take that position because of the Bay Area. Great. So, so you had that in mind. I mean, you were looking yeah. for, okay, that was part, that was yeah. part of, a, of a very clear decision. Yeah, Chicago was a great city. It's, a, it's actually a very interesting gastronomy city. Uh, you don't think so. You think it's Midwest and you think it may be comfort food, but uh, they have a very good culinary scene there. They had the best restaurant in America for years, Alinea, which was the chef Grant Atkins who had the uh, molecular gastronomy restaurant. So I had the fortune, good fortune of eating there. He's got a very good um, molecular beverage operation called Aviary, where uh, it's very, very uh, contemporary experience with craft cocktails. So Chicago has had a good food scene, but you can't really compare that to the Bay Area. Got it. So when you reached uh, the University of San Francisco and the hospitality management program, what was your role? What was your, uh, what did they hire you, you for? And where are you today with the university? Are you in the same role or how did your role progress through the years? I'm in, I'm in the same role, but I do other things. So I'm hired as an associate professor. I teach uh, a food service, uh, culinary arts, and entrepreneurship class with Chef Jean-Marc Fosek. Uh, in that class, we teach students how to do business plans and come up with entrepreneurial ways to uh, create food service or restaurant or event, uh, food trucks, any type of uh, entrepreneurship uh, ideas and build a financial statement and market and uh, design logos and, and product. Uh, I teach a revenue management class, which is uh, for hotel and restaurant. You see my research is in that area. So that's a very important class. And then I teach a hospitality leadership and management course that really gets into all of those things that I learned in industry, but also applying my PhD and my leadership degree and merging the theory with the practice. So, uh, and then lastly, my uh, favorite class is a beverage management class, which is one of the, besides Chef Full Sex, cooking class is the most popular class on campus, of course, because we do uh, very thorough wine tastings and uh, craft cocktails and uh, celebrate the, the, uh, the great uh, Napa Valley and uh, wine regions all over the world. So 
those are my primary classes, but I also teach in the MBA program. I teach a business modeling and ideation class, and that's where you saw I utilize the uh, training from Harvard in design thinking, which is a um, innovative way to approach uh, creative thinking through a process of, of iterative thinking. And I use that design thinking method to teach business modeling. And we work with Bay Area companies, uh, tech companies, gastronomy companies, wine, food, you name it. And we solve problems for them. So every six weeks, I take on about six companies from the Bay Area and work with the uh, MBA students and we solve their most pressing problems, which is a great way to take advantage of the Bay Area and Silicon Valley and technology and gastronomy and throw it all together. So it really keeps me learning. It keeps me uh, current with what's happening in the market and allows me to experiment with different ways to teach and to learn. And it's proven to be popular with students. So how many people, how many students do you have on your, in your MBA class and how many students follow the hospitality management program? Overall, the hospitality program, we have close to 100 students undergrad uh, in our program. Uh, we graduate about 25 a year. Um, and then in the MBA program, those can range, uh, the total MBA group, I think, is about 50. So I'll have a class of 50, but they'll break it into two sections of 25 each. So how do you find, when you do those studies or when you are helping those companies out based in the uh, Bay Area, how do, they know, how do they know about what you're doing? Are you reaching out to them? Yes. Or do yes. they know about your program already by word of mouth? How, how does this come? Well, I reach out to them through the networking in the Bay Area with uh, you know, Jean-Marc Fulsack and with uh, others in our program that know companies that we've worked with in the food and beverage space in our program. We work a lot with alumni that graduates of University of San Francisco, uh, but we meet with uh, industry leaders like yourself that are highly visible and do good programming like La Pero. So uh, it, it's, it's good to meet people like yourself and others that are leaders in the community and in the market that are doing innovative programming. So I can find them, but then also I solicit and I reach out and I cold call. Uh, like for example, I'm working on a summer project right now with Hewlett Packard. They've asked us to work with a group of MBA students on micro learning and how internally they can enhance and upskill their workforce. So. There's a lot of companies that have issues on things that they want to adapt to, so it's not hard to find projects. Uh, it's finding the right project and the right project sponsor that can provide a good learning environment for the students and a challenging project. Very well. So could you, I saw in your, I saw a few studies that you've done with your students, mm -hmm. and could you tell us a bit more about the Chef Guy Savoy restaurant? Yeah. What, because that, I mean, we're talking about the best restaurant in the world. So I think it's a, it's not too shabby, if you pardon yeah. my French. Yeah, that's can you, good. Can you tell us about this one? And I, I'm, I will be curious as well. I'm just picking like a menu, you see. I'm like sure. in a restaurant. I want to know a bit more about the Fairmont Sonoma mission in and spa as well. So I'll take those two. Okay, you great. Talk about those two experiences? Yeah. One is food and one is more a uh, hotel. Can you sure. tell us? Sure. Of course, Pierre, you picked the best of the best, uh, <laughs> knowing, knowing you, right? So, uh, you know, Guy Savoie, that project has been probably one of the best experiences I've had in my entire life. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, my PhD in leadership uh, was in generational leadership. So I studied the different generational perceptions of managers. So baby boomers, millennials, Gen Xers, and Gen Z. So after I graduated, um, I had generations on my mind. I went to Vegas and I met Guy Savoie's son, Franck, who was a Gen Xer at the time. He was the maitre d' of Guy Savoie's restaurant in Las Vegas at Caesar's Palace. And because I love French gastronomy from my days in Hawaii and, and uh, as a food director, I never lost touch with very good food and wine. So whenever I'm on business or traveling, I usually seek out a good restaurant to enjoy. So I started talking with Frank Savoie and told him that I was a, a PhD in generational leadership. And he said, you know, my father and I are a family, uh, two generations that work together. And I said, well, it'd be great if I could write a story about you and your father. I said, would that be possible? He said, yes, of course. He goes, if you go to Paris, I'll arrange for you to meet him and you can meet him. So of course I made an appointment. I went to his restaurant. His uh, previous Michelin restaurant was over by the Champs-Élysées on a, on a, 
Rue Trayon, a very small, indiscreet alley in France with the cobblestone, uh, one way with the cobblestone stones and a, a very uh, undefined entranceway. You would never think it was a, it was a Michelin three-star restaurant. I walked in there for lunch with a suit and tie on and I had a proposal and I booked a reservation for lunch. They started serving me. When I walked in the door, I said, is uh, Monsieur uh, Guy Savoie gonna be here today? I'd like to introduce myself. And they said, of course, he meets all of his guests. Please, please, Mr. Meyer, sit down and have your lunch. So they were totally focused on my experience. About halfway through the eight course lunch, he comes out of the uh, kitchen, comes over to the table, introduces himself. I stand up and I said, I met your son, Frank. I, I had a book that I had written earlier for a textbook on hospitality. And I did a small feature of Guy Savoie and his son in the book. I brought that book and I opened it up. I was standing in his dining room and I pointed to him and his son and I said, this is you and your son. I wrote that about you and I gave him the book. And I said, I hope you enjoy it. He didn't speak clear English. So uh, he came over later. He sent me a couple of courses too during the, uh, during the lunch, compliments of the chef. One of them was a nice piece of foie gras and a glass of Bordeaux wine. So uh, his assistant came later after the meal and gave me a, a, a bag and the bag had a bunch of uh, videos and books about Guy Savoie. And at that time in English, she interpreted and told me that uh, I, I proposed to her right there on the spot. I said, could I write a book about uh, Monsieur Savoie and his son, Franck? And he said, they're interested, write a proposal and send it in. So I was on my way to Dubai because I was teaching in Dubai for RIT at the time. I wrote the uh, outline of the book on the plane from Paris to Dubai because I wanted to move quickly mm -hmm. and get it in his hands the next day so that mm -hmm. he knew I was serious. So the next day I sent him the proposal uh, and as I was going through the, the proposal, I tried to figure out how could I embed myself and get into his world and experience everything about French gastronomy through him. So I wrote several chapters that allowed me to spend time with him and spend time around France learning about his network. Uh, and that was the smartest thing I ever did because I put in there a section about his vendors, where he gets his carrots from, where he gets his uh, chickens, the breast de poulet, where he gets his oysters from, uh, where he apprenticed. And I had the plan to allow him to, to invite me to go talk with all of these people about France because I loved France. I loved French gastronomy. I thought what a great way to learn about it by interviewing people that work with Guy Savoie. So luckily after two weeks, he agreed. I started going to France. I spent two years. I went there probably three times a year for a week at a time. I had to hire an interpreter because he insisted, he speaks English, but he insisted that if I interview him, that I have to, he has to speak in French because he has to speak from his heart and he doesn't want to be worried about making the right word uh, fit for what he wants to say. So I began meeting him in his restaurant in Rue Troyon, and we'd interview for 45 minutes. I asked his permission, could I stand in the restaurant the entire day and observe his operation? The best restaurant in the world. I knew if he let me in there, I would stand in there till my feet were aching for 12 hours because I wanted to see how it worked. And thankfully that I had spent so many years earlier in my career that I knew how to handle myself in a kitchen. If you walk into a kitchen and you don't know what you're doing and you start bumping into people and you start interfering with the operation, you get, a, you get escorted out of the kitchen very quickly. So I, had, I just stood against the wall like a fly on the wall, stayed out of the way, and I watched his Michelin three-star restaurant from opening at 8 a.m. till closing at midnight. I got a hotel right down the street. I took a nap for two hours between the lunch service and the dinner service kept my suit on and I watched and watched and watched for two years to learn what he is all about. And he's a fascinating man. He cares so much about customers and food that he's so intense that that translates into the best. Uh, he focuses so much on the ingredients and the freshness of the food and the importance of sourcing the vendor the right way. Price is no object. You don't even bring up price with him. How much is a tomato? He doesn't care. He wants the best, freshest tomato. So that was a great experience. I wrote a book about leadership and the difference between his leadership style and Franck's leadership style, about the French brigade system, about the way they operate their kitchen, 
and all of that, it was fascinating. And from there, uh, I met so many interesting French uh, gastronomy professionals. Uh, we could talk for days. So the, that book that you wrote is available on Amazon. And yes. it is called Hospitality Leadership Lessons in French Gastronomy, The Story of Guy and Frank Savoie, S-A-V-O-Y, Yes. Paris, friends. So if anyone has any questions on what you have, you know, references, please leave a comment. I will be happy to send you the link to the book you wrote. Sure. And to this whole, uh, so so f for him, I mean, as far as research and collaboration, you came with a price indexing and social media analysis for, for I mean, yes. for the Savoy family. Yes. So what I, did, what I did after I met him is after I wrote the book, I didn't want to just lose the relationship. So I tried to keep it going. And he's so busy that you have to have something of value. And I teach my students, you have to think about your own personal value proposition when you're interacting with people. What is it of value about me interacting with Guy Savoie? The first value was I wrote a book about him and his son. Nobody's ever done that. So that was unique. That was the value to him. So he afforded me the courtesy of seeing his restaurant and interviewing him. So to keep it going, I wanted to teach my students about price theory. So price indexing is where you evaluate five competitors against your own pricing and you evaluate, are you getting your fair share of the price? So if Pierre, you and I both have a restaurant with a five course meal and you charge a hundred and I charge a hundred, that means our combined price index is 100. We're both charging the same price and getting the same price. If you lower your price to 80 and I keep my price at 100, that means your price index is now 80% of the market, okay? Now, you purposely may wanna lower your price or you may not because you're not informed. So price indexing allows you to validate what is your pricing strategy. Now, if your price is 100 and my price is 120, my price index then is 120, meaning I'm priced 20% higher than you. So what I did is I took Guy Savoie's menus from Vegas, Singapore, and Paris, and I had my students learn how to do the price indexing analysis against his competitors, and then send him the results so that he could see how he was priced. So when you did that, how many students were working with you on this? 22 students. 22 students. And, 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 you, and that mission took how long? One year, six months? Well, that took uh, well, 10 weeks during the class one class one class and by the way we did the same thing for for uh claude toek and, oh, yeah. and 165 mm -hmm. i do that to many restaurants it's a great way for the students to learn pricing and for the restaurants to have somebody work on their competition pricing for them because they're so busy doing other things that's fantastic well yeah well just to hear to hear from your story i wish i, I would have been here with you writing this book <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's fun. And tell us about the Fairmont Sonoma Inn and Spa. What did you do for that luxury resort spa based in, in Sonoma uh, next to San Francisco? So 45 yeah. minutes an hour away from San Francisco. What did you do for them? That one was a good project. Uh, I'm bound by a confidentiality agreement. I can't tell you too much oh. detail, but I can tell you the nature of the project. So that yes. one was for our MBA business modeling class I told you about earlier. Yes. So a team of six MBA students, they were asked to go in there and look at the spa. Now in hotels, not everybody realizes the different departments, right? You have the front office and rooms, concierge, bell desk, transportation services, housekeeping, maintenance and engineering, food and beverage, catering, uh, and then you have spa. Spa is considered another revenue generating department, but spas are very labor intensive. So they have a low profit margin. So as an example, a food and beverage operation in a hotel, if it makes 10 to 15% profit margin, it's doing well. Spas are below 5%. And uh, not, not the uh, Fairmont in particular, but generally speaking, spas have a low profit margin. So we were asked to evaluate all the different products that the spa offers in terms of treatments and facials and um, retail products and analyze the different mix of sales, which areas have what kind of sales and which margins of profit on each of those areas of sales can be improved. So we studied their financials, studied their customer base, and did some analysis on the mix of customers and the mix of sales 
and made recommendations on how to improve profitability. Well, you are an amazing source for any hotels listening to us today, any restaurant, food and beverage companies. You have the capacities, you have the brain power, you have the student resources to really come up fairly quickly with very in detail uh, studies and uh, I mean valuable information that can really improve the way business work. I mean it's uh, I'm sure a lot of people don't know that the USF was providing this and hopefully from our discussion you're going to have more people coming to you. Yeah, you bring up a great point, Pierre, because the most important thing for me is, is it's interesting, so it keeps me engaged as a professor. But more importantly, my goal with our students, it's called experiential learning. I teach, a, I teach very little out of a textbook. In fact, I don't, I don't have textbooks in any of my classes. I believe these learning experiences also get the student ready so that by the time they walk out of school, they're already engaged in activities that the business is doing or not doing that the student can show them. So for example, they can walk into a spa and say, oh, let me look at your profitability. I did a project. Let me look and see, here's what you can do. So they're ready to get on right away. Uh, same thing with the pricing and the geese of wah, the 165, we did that in our beverage class. Uh, so I believe that our education has to be experiential. And I learned that through my, my uh, experience in industry, plus my work at Harvard in teaching learning how to uh, engage students and have them think visibly about real problems, but then apply them. And that works really well for our program. And I think that's a differentiator uh, of our program than the state schools and the other big universities because we have small classrooms and we can engage in these kind of projects with teams of four or five students working on a project with a chef or with a business. Wow. And you know, because I mean, you. I look, you're not only doing restaurants and hotels, you've done as well uh, tech companies, right? Correct? You yes. work for. Yes. So it's not limited to only no. hospitality. No. And that's fascinating, too, Pierre. When I left Chicago to come here, I told you there was three things, but I left out Silicon Valley. You know, I'm a, I'm a baby, I'm an early baby boomer, meaning I'm on the tail end of millennials. I'm still getting old. Oh, come on, Tom. Come it's, on. A, it's important to stay fresh with technology, especially in the Bay Area. So for me to continue learning and to be able to add value to my students, remember I told you, what is your value proposition? This is what I share with my students. Uh, the fact that I can work with Apple and Hewlett Packard and those companies, tech companies and fintech companies in the Bay Area, you can, tr you can transfer that knowledge of what they're doing and apply it to hospitality because hospitality tends to be behind the high tech. Now, they're not really far behind. I don't say that as a criticism. I say that as an opportunity. But you can imagine now if you can cross-pollinate Silicon Valley with Napa Valley, French gastronomy and all that together, it really offers a ripe opportunity to teach and for students to learn. And I... I looked at the different studies you've done with your group, but I see Bank of America, mm -hmm. I see uh, Adobe, I see Fidelity Financial, yep. uh, HP, Cisco, I mean, Rocket, uh, Rocket Space. I mean, it's really, it's really broad. I mean, you, you really cover a lot of ground. Yeah, that's the rich area that we live in there in the Bay Area. I think it's a very interesting learning environment. It's like a Petri dish of so many things to experiment with, you have no, yet not enough time in the day. Yes, I agree. That's why I like to live, like, like you, I think a lot of people lack the Bay Area for being so rich and so diverse on yes. different levels. That's why we need La Perro. That's right. <laughs> we need a happy hour. That's right. So I looked at your uh, scholarly publication in referred journals. People, this is what I printed out. <laughs> you, you, you really covered a lot of ground, Thomas. Uh, out of those 20 publications, is there one that you, and I, and I know it's a hard question to ask, is there one that you're really the most proud of or where you learned the most uh, working yeah. on that publication? Is there one that stands out for you? Yeah, there's two, uh, I'll, and I'll be brief. 
Yeah. First one is the um, restaurant revenue management framework that was published in the Penn State Journal, or it was published uh, with my colleague from Penn State, Brefni Noon. Brefni Noon is a uh, is a young scholar uh, who's probably one of the top five revenue management researchers in the country, and her and I partnered up together because. A lot of the revenue management uh, theory is research in um, hotels. It's mostly on online distribution, right? The uh, online travel agencies and yeah. how to price and how to reach those dis different distribution channels. And there's very little work done on restaurant revenue management. And restaurant revenue management lacked a framework for restaurant tours to figure out how should I approach revenue management. So what we did there is I did a lot of research work in Chicago with the Gibson Steakhouse, which is a very famous steakhouse in um, Chicago, very high volume steakhouse. I think they were the top 10 grossing restaurants in the country, close to $30 million a year. They do a thousand customers a night serving uh, prime grade beef. So um, I did a lot of observation visits, similar to what I did with Guy Savoie. I did the same thing in Chicago, but this time for academic research, so what I started looking at was the revenue per available seat hour. So in hotels, it's RevPAR. Hotels, you measure revenue per available room. In restaurants, you measure revenue per available seat hour, meaning if I have a four top and that four top sits there for eight hours, how many times is somebody sitting in that chair and how many of those chairs are vacant? So it's the same principles, but it's applied to a different terminology. So my article there, provided a framework on how to approach restaurant revenue management, looking at seat duration, how long does somebody sit, um, looking at party size, does a two top, a four top, a six top, or an eight top yield more profit during peak demand for an hour. So for example, if you, you might think if you've got a party of six to bring in at six o'clock when your restaurant is maxed out, that you take them every time because they're gonna generate more profit. But not, not necessarily, you could turn over four four tops in an hour and make more money than one six top in an hour. So that's what we call party size. So table duration, how long do I eat as a party? The party size, um, average check and dynamic pricing. I'm a, I'm a proponent of, I believe restaurants should have dynamic pricing. So consumers aren't gonna like what I'm having to say, but restaurateurs are. And what I mean by dynamic pricing is I learned this in Hawaii. In Hawaii at 6.30 when sunset and you have an oceanfront dining room and you have 100 seats, but only 25 of the seats face the ocean, everybody wants to sit in the oceanfront seat during sunset. Why should you charge the same price when there's so much more demand for that seat at sunset? I would rather charge by row. So the farther you are from the ocean, the lower the price, the closer you are to the ocean, the higher the price. But the restaurant industry, as I mentioned earlier, was a little bit behind the curve. They don't, they still believe in, in the, the importance of the one-on-one -on -one dialogue and the customer service interaction. They don't want to charge one customer a different price than the same customer. So that's what I mean by dynamic pricing. So that was part of what we did in that restaurant revenue management framework. Um, the, the other article was the private club uh, I did some research for a private club. The private club wanted to know if we could predict when club members were most likely to resign. So if you had, so what was happening at the time is a, a lot of the baby boomers and veteran generation are dying and yes. they're leaving the clubs. So yes. the clubs have to build memberships with lower generation millennials and Gen Xers, but they have different tastes on what they want out of a private club versus different generations. So the club wanted us to use advanced analytics to figure out, is there any indicators that can predict when the members are most likely to leave? And what we found there, that was a very, very big data analytical uh, uh, research project. And I, I collaborated with a data scientist. Um, so I needed some help there quantitatively to do that project. But what we ended up finding out was the best predictor of when a member was gonna leave is when they stopped attending non-revenue generating events at the club. So for example, uh, the club would have a free speech every month and members could go for free. Like an economist would come and give a lecture. We found within 45 days of a member not going to a free event, they were more likely to resign. 
which is common sense, right? If I stop going to things that are free, I don't see the value of going anymore. I'm not engaged. Mm. So that was a really good using big data to predict a, a, a member behavior. And you did that, that study was done in 2016. Yes. And it was published in the Journal of Hospitality, Marketing and Management. Yes. And the first uh, publication we talked about uh, was done in 2015 and was published in the Journal of Pricing and Revenue Management. I have all those information. So if anyone has questions and wants to have access to it, we'll be happy to, to share where, where to find them. Very well. Well, uh, let me ask you something. We're talking about you know, food and beverage and how it has changed in the hotel industry as far as bringing, you know, bringing revenue to a property. You know, it's the COVID, yeah. <laughs> with the COVID happening, first of all, a lot of hotels have been shut down, you know, like in San Francisco where they're gonna reopen, hopefully by mid-August. They are open in Sonoma and Napa Valley and in Monterey right now, but how do you think the COVID and is going to, on the post, I should say the post COVID is going to affect food and beverage mm -hmm. at property level. What, what do you think is going to be the trend and what impact that it, will it have? Great question. First of all, I think what, I think uh, I'm of the opinion that in uh, 2019, that in the US, uh, the, the restaurant market was overbuilt. So I believe there were, there were many more restaurants than consumers. So I think what happened with the COVID is that those restaurant tours that had very low margins and were barely making it were flushed out. So anybody that had a lot of debt and did not have good operating margins, they probably are gone. Uh, and then now post COVID, it's putting pressure on a couple of different things. One, I think indoor dining is, is, um, is less enjoyable now because people are worried. But more importantly, there's so many different health protocols that you have to go through for good reason, that it's, it's hurting the socialization process of indoor dining. So you have plastic screens, you have trying touchless payment, um, you have, you have uh, masks, um, you have social distancing. So people are, are not able to go to uh, have convivial conversation with one another. So I think indoor dining is gonna be slow to recover. So patio, outdoor dining, with a lot of space, open air restaurants, I think are gonna do really well. And then also um, curbside takeout. And I believe counter service are gonna be important. So counter service for two reasons. One, I think because volumes are gonna be down and um, the number of people you can serve is, is, is dictated to you because of distancing, uh, you're gonna to have to have less labor. So you have to, figure out ways to operate the restaurant more efficiently. So what I believe there is smaller menus, um, but very focused, targeted, good, fresh food, quick service, but maybe adapted service so that it's counter dine-in or counter takeout where you come up and you order, you get your food, um, much like Super Duper Burger, for example, even though that's a fast casual uh, burger place, if you look at that, they have no front of the house, just two cashiers you, in San Francisco, you get your, you get your food and you, you dispose of your, your uh, plate and you leave. That means they have six to eight less front of the house employees, which brings your labor costs down because in the Bay area as one of the most expensive areas to operate a restaurant to begin with, labor costs are high 55 to 60%. When you have 55% labor cost and 35% food cost, you're already at 90% before you even bought supplies, uniforms, menus, anything else. So the margins are very small. So post COVID, I think it's gonna be on simplicity, uh, cost effective labor, and meeting the customer where they wanna be met with social distancing and price value. Do you think some properties or some flag may, may stop food and beverage as a whole? I think they may. I think they're looking at ways to, if they have outdoor dining, if they have patio dining, then I think they're going to be fine. Uh, a couple hotels are experimenting with robotic room service delivery, mm. uh, but that's, that's not uh, for everybody and customers still aren't quite 
willing to accept a robot showing up at their door or their guest room to give them their food because they still want the people yeah. interaction. But having said that, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the larger hotels with 15 outlets, uh, you know, shrink down to five or six outlets. There's no reason to have so many outlets when occupancy is low. So yes, I think all the food and beverage directors are going to have to look at outlets that are not profitable and don't necessarily diminish the customer experience. Very well. I have a question about people looking to, you know, we have some viewers who, who are curious to learn about the hospitality uh, industry. And, you know, maybe when we talk, it, it will me, make, me, make them want to be part of this industry. That was hard. What advice, what qualities do you think a student who uh, wants to apply to the hospitality management program at the University of San Francisco needs to have? What kind of attitude, qualities uh, in order to be successful in the future and to, to feel well and to do well needs to have? Great question. So I think adaptability. First and foremost, you have to be adaptable to your environment. Um, secondly, I think you have to enjoy what you do. So you have to like and have a passion for either food or people or places, right? Our industry is, is, is wounded right now because of the COVID, but I don't think that's going to go on forever. So as we were talking earlier, I was able to, to grow up in New York. I was able to work in Chicago, uh, Dubai, Kosovo, um, Vienna, Hong Kong, Singapore, San Francisco, Hawaii, travel to China. I become a world traveler because of our industry. And I believe that's one of our best benefits. So you have to be flexible and adaptable and enjoy being around people. But I think you also have to be analytical now. I believe that technology continues to move and digitalization continues to overtake the way we operate our businesses. So I think you have to be analytical. I don't think you have to be a data scientist and a mathematician to be analytical. I think it's common sense. The price indexing and some of the work that I've been doing with our students, they adapt to it very quickly. They understand it. Um, I think you have to work hard, which I know sounds old fashioned, but working hard and working smart uh, are ways that you can make an advancement in your career. And I think you have to be curious. I think you have to be curious to try new things and you have to be experimental and think differently about uh, our business because it's going to continue to evolve and change. And there's going to be great opportunity for entrepreneurs if you want to have your own business. Uh, like, like I said earlier, big fish, small pond. If you go to a corporation as a small fish to learn how to run a business at that level, then it's easy to go off and start your own business if you get the right kind of backing and work for yourself for your life. That's something that's still very doable if you have the right idea and the right training, in my opinion. And I think our industry and our program in particular can prepare you for that. Thank you. Well, thank you for the, that's good. Very good. Very clear. Uh, listen, uh, Thomas, we are getting close to the hour and I like to, to end up our discussion with your favorites. So your personal favorites. And I think I know a few of them, but let me ask you that. What, is the best restaurant you ever had a lunch at or dinner at? I think I know. Okay, great. I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of two of my. So my best di uh, best uh, dinner was at Guy Savoie's restaurant, his new Michelin restaurant over by uh, the uh, Museum d'Orsay. Oh yeah, Museum d'Orsay. Uh, the La Monnaie. Yeah. So that's my favorite dinner experience. My favorite lunch experience was at Pierre Troigo in Lyon. Spectacular spectacular and you're thinking of running a book about it or doing something yes i think i uh pierre trago is another generational story pierre and michelle trago and then michelle trago has a son so i think that could be a nice three generational story oh yeah well yeah and then you will have to go to lyon I'll have to hang out to... Lyon. yeah i went to you'll, you'll find this funny and most french people will find this funny because i was time constricted in the same day i had lunch at Paul Bocuse, yeah. or no, other way around. I had lunch at Pierre Trago and I had dinner at Paul Bocuse oh in the same day. Oh my God, no. <laughs> same day. <laughs> the funniest thing about Paul Bocuse restaurant is he collected the, uh, 
Jack in the Boxes. I don't know if you knew that. No. If you go look up his site, he collects the Jack in the Box, you know, the uh, clown pops out of the box. Yeah, yeah. He has a museum and he collects them. When you go in his restaurant, his classic restaurant in Lyon, a waiter brings the cart around with the bell cap hat on and plays the thing, you know, and the thing pops out. So that was the funnest day I ever had, gastronomy wise, but I was very full. I could barely walk the next day. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, if you just do Pierre Poigreau for lunch, it, it, it usually takes you two or three days to recover from it. But if you do Bocuse the same day at night, oh, my God. Well, hey. only, only a stupid American would do that. No, well, no, you, you had no choice. And if you have the opportunity, well, you had to take it, right? So, best person, what is your, the best property you went to as far as service, location? where really you were like, well, and, and I mean, you work in Hawaii, in, in Kauai, in beautiful hotels. Uh, maybe it's one of them, but I'm just curious to see what's you, from all two, the different two favorite travels. hotels. One is the Raffles Hotel in Singapore. It's a colonial mm -hmm. style hotel, very beautiful. But my most favorite is the Burj Al Arab in Dubai. Burj Al Arab. It's the one that looks like the sail of the big ship. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, that one is fabulous. You walk inside and there's a concierge waiting for you at the entryway with rosebud tea and a fresh lemon water towel and welcomes you. And then you're escorted over and you're checked in one by one at a, at a small furniture desk. And then it has water fountains and beads that go all the way up the interior. It's just spectacular. The service there is grand. So in those two properties, the, I mean, the location was fantastic and the service was service pretty Service excellence. Uh, just the graciousness and the natural service attitude which what comes out in a beautiful setting with the finest equipment and the finest design. If, we, if, uh, if you have to choose one dish, your favorite dish, Cold or hot, your favorite dish. Do, is, do you have one that you have in mind? Me, it's camembert with butter and bread. So it's very simple. But what would be your favorite dish? Mine is a, mine is a, uh, is a Thai. Foie gras. Yeah. With a glass of burgundy. Yeah. Or Bordeaux. Or Guy Savoie's famous black artichoke soup. Uh, artichoke soup with black truffles and brioche bread. Nice. Sounds good. Yeah. I want it. <laughs> yeah. Me too. <laughs> Thomas, we are at the hour. Uh, I want to really thank you for your time. All the precious feedback. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will have learned a lot about the industry. I, I thank you for the advice uh, about food and beverage and what you think people should do. Uh, because, I mean, you know, with the COVID, it's very difficult right now. We are going through tough times, and I think you have very valuable uh, information and feedback that can be uh, life-saving for some of those businesses. So I'm, I'm definitely going to spread that interview to all my friends in the, in the food business for them to listen to it. Uh, do you have any last words? Is there anything you yes, want to the, add? The most important thing, Pierre, is I have to thank you because you're the best collaborator for our university program and I mean that sincerely, I, I would consider you a professor among us uh, because your organization, La Perot, is one of the finest food gastronomy marketing organizations I've ever seen. And the fact that we can collaborate with you and our students can learn from you, that you spend time coming to our classrooms and teaching our students is exceptional. And we're so grateful for you and we love partnering with you uh, and checking in to see what you're up to. Very good. Well, just a small paraphrase. L'Apero is a non-profit association where we do the promotion of French gastronomy and hospitality. It's a bridge between the U.S. and France. And we have hoteliers that comes in, general managers of different properties. We have restaurants owners who come in. We have food and beverage specialists. And we have, you know, students coming in. We have people who are just curious to know about the you know the hospitality and food industry in general so it's open to everybody from any nationalities obviously there is no more events going on right now so we do everything online 
And uh, I think you and I have a lot in common, Tom, because you love hospitality and you love gastronomy. And I'm so glad we had this chat. And in, if anyone has any questions, information, please make sure to add those comments and we will uh, answer to them. And uh, Thomas, I think uh, I hope to see you soon. Yes. We see how it goes. And uh, for everybody, do not forget, if you have study you want to have made by very talented students with a very talented leader, well, now you know where to go, okay? It's right here. University of San Francisco, they have amazing resources. They are very brilliant. They are local, they know the market, they have experience. And you should really uh, uh, contact Thomas Meyer, Professor Thomas Meyer, for any uh, request. But let me know, I will put you in touch. Thomas, thank you very much. You're welcome. Merci beaucoup. You have a great day. À bientôt. Yes, au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Salut. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>